Good afternoon, North Dakota, and welcome to today's uh, briefing. Uh, North Dakota Department of Health confirmed today 75 additional cases of the novel coronavirus disease or COVID-19 out of 1,987 tests, which is a new record high test for a 24-hour period. Uh, sadly, we must report the two North Dakotans with COVID-19 <clears throat> passed away over the night, over the weekend, and today we had an additional uh, two who also passed away. Uh, Saturday was a man in his 90s from Cass County. Uh, Sunday, a woman in her 80s from Cass County. And then today, two men in their 80s from Cass County. All four had underlying health conditions. And as always, from the First Lady and myself, our deepest sympathies and prayers go out to the loved ones and to everyone who's lost someone uh, during this pandemic. In total, uh, 19 North Dakotans have passed away uh, with COVID. Uh, North Dakota has conducted now 22,434 tests, uh, a cumulative total of 942 positives. Uh, that is our positive rate in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, 4.2%. Uh, that remains the fifth lowest rate in the country behind Hawaii, Alaska, West Virginia, and Montana. Uh, we continue to working to increase on our testing rates to more closely match uh, this need for increased capacity. And we're happy to report again these high numbers of tests that were done over the weekend. Big shout out to all that will, were involved, local health officials, North Dakota National Guard, uh, our teams that are leading the uh, testing and contact tracing, people from North Dakota Department of Health, but big team effort. Uh, and all reports are that things went smoothly on these. On Friday, we reported a record number of completed tests in one day coming out of completed tests as coming out of our state lab and the private providers that we also work with like Sanford and Mayo, uh, as well as the local ID Now machines. Saturday, we broke that record with 1,901 completed tests. And again, broke that record again today, 1,987 completed tests. And I wanna say again, thank you to the people. Uh, I know last week was uh, national lab technicians, but to get this kind of volume, uh, which is way more than 10 times capacity that we were delivering uh, just a month ago, 10x increase uh, requires a lot of folks that are putting in lots of hours, uh, setting up new machines, learning new procedures, installing uh, new equipment, and, and again, just some of it is working lots of long hours. So thanks to all the existing team members and new ones that have joined that effort because we're moving uh, that, as you know, to a 24-hour a day operation. Next up, we want to talk about the uh, active confirmed cases. This is the number of cases we're actually dealing with in the state, 573 active, uh, which means we've had 350 uh, have recovered. Uh, currently, 23 are hospitalized. That jumped up again. We were back down in the teens. But again, this remains at uh, <clears throat> approximately 1% of our uh, hospital capacity before we even get into the surge thing. So we've got a lot of hospital capacity left. When we take a look at the next slide in terms of North Dakota trends, again, uh, you can see that with 75 new cases and only 24 recovered, uh, minus, uh, sadly, the two deaths, we had a net 49 increase, so another day where we increased uh, the number of positives. That's not a not not the trend we're looking for uh, necessarily, but we are doing such so much more testing. Uh, this is somewhat to be expected in terms of an absolute number, uh, because if you look back on this bar uh, over the past uh, five six weeks, at the early days we were only doing a couple hundred tests a day. Now we're doing close to 2,000 tests a day, so we are going to see the absolute number increase. So the real uh, uh, need for us to really focus on is that rolling 14-day average, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but it, it has remained relatively flat, hovering about 6.3% for the last 14 days, uh, which is great that that number is staying flat while we're really ramping up testing. Uh, next uh, topic is, uh, you know, since we, this whole effort began uh, on March 11th, uh, we learned a lot about this uh, disease, uh, this contagious disease, and we've learned that it spreads really quickly. We've heard that it spreads without regard for, you know, state or county borders. Uh, 
we've learned that it can take loved ones too soon, and we've learned that it disrupts livelihoods too often, uh, leaving you know behind a wake of both emotional and economic hardship. But during this time since March 11th in our first case, we've also learned a lot about ourselves as North Dakotans. It was six weeks ago that I challenged all of us at the start to let go of being what we used to call North Dakota tough, which was that thing where you'd get up and go to work even if you were sick and put in a full day's work because that's what we learned from our parents and grandparents. Uh, we've had to embrace a new thing called North Dakota smart, uh, which is if you're not well, you stay home, uh, as well as follow a bunch of other hygiene and physical distancing practices. Uh, but when we put out the call for North Dakota Smart, North Dakotans answered. And North Dakota, uh, unlike uh, some other states, was uh, remained largely open for business. 93% of our workforce was not impacted directly by the restrictions in the Executive Order 2026. Uh, those that were, uh, the 7% that were in terms of jobs in North Dakota, we know it's been especially a challenging time for you, and we're grateful for all of your sacrifices and resiliency. Uh, and we're talking again, this, in this group, we're talking about people that worked in bars or restaurants and breweries or cafes. Some of them have kept working and have built really uh, significant uh, carry out and off sale businesses. Uh, but recreation facilities, health clubs, athletic facilities were uh, closed. Uh, cosmetologists, estheticians, manicurists, uh, massage therapy, barbershops, personal care, tattoo, body art, uh, those were all closed. And so again, this is the, the people that worked in these sectors, the 7% uh, that, that we are grateful for your sacrifice and your resiliency. We're also grateful to the federal government for the enormous amount of federal stimulus dollars that have been uh, injected and made available, including to uh, organizations that before uh, were not even paying into unemployment insurance, but now can collect uh, uninsurance, you know, their, collect their insurance, unemployment insurance payments. Uh, and we're also grateful to the SBA and all of the incredible loan programs, which are really grant programs if small businesses kept their, their team 75% uh, of their team working. So there's been uh, some sacrifice, but there's also been uh, some some great opportunities that are out there. And, and again, we talked about some of those on Friday. Uh, SBA loans uh, opened up for business again today for the PPP or the Payroll Protection Plan uh, grants slash loans. Uh, the North Dakota Department of Commerce has been working with private industry and six working groups to develop North Dakota Smart Restart Protocols. Uh, to be enacted when we've got our eight conditions for North Dakota Smart Restart achieved. Uh, we want to uh, walk through those uh, eight uh, things. We're going to do that next. Uh, the first uh, one of those that we're going to walk to go through is this one through eight right here on the eight criteria. Uh, has to do with... Uh, Testing and as you see really making great progress here fantastic progress uh, we have Achieved as we approached uh, we said last week that before the end of May we were going to try to get over 1800 tests we've done that two days in a row uh, With more than 1900 tests not only collected but also coming through the labs So that's fantastic. We have been reporting throughout this that we were either going to be Ninth or we were either ninth in the country or tenth in the country in tests per capita uh, With the strong showing on Friday Saturday and Sunday we catapulted to number six in the nation uh, in per capita tests Testing. And this is significant because uh, the first four states on that list are states that received an enormous amount of federal aid and were big hotspots, states like New York and Massachusetts and Louisiana. Uh, and the other state that's moving up with us that's a non-hotspot state is, the, is Utah, uh, which I know Governor Gary Herbert and his administration, they've always uh, are, got their act together in great competition. But we're slipstreaming behind Utah as we move up this list, but we're uh, number sixth out of all states, but we're number two of states on per capita testing in the country who haven't had a big outbreak. And our, our plan is to move from where we are now uh, as we're coming close to this 2,000 mark. We want to get to 4,000 in May and 6,000 in June. Plans are in place. Machines have been ordered. Uh, assurances have been made from suppliers that we should have the capability to do that. And we'll, that will be both a mix of uh, inbound testing by 
providers that continue to be able to uh, loosen up their restrictions so that literally anybody who wants to get tested can and our outbound testing efforts like we've had over the weekend uh, to make sure that we're uh, getting lots of samples collected at a time when people might not be going to their provider. Also in another drill down of this uh, when going forward, uh, again, 60% of our testing is gonna be prioritized for diagnostic, meaning people that we know may have been exposed like healthcare workers or first responders or vulnerable populations. We do have a plan in place to try to test everybody that's in a long-term care facility uh, in North Dakota. And we're gonna need these kinds of volumes if we're gonna do that and then regularly be testing their staff. Uh, but also we want to do about 40%, which is called either sentinel or surveillance testing uh, at each event, which is, again, we might be testing asympt asymptomatic people uh, and just doing random, random testing because this will help us understand uh, if it's popping up or not uh, in, our, in our communities. So that's number one, and I would uh, say we're making great progress on that. Number two uh, has to do with a targeted, or excuse me, with a robust uh, contact tracing. And currently we've talked about how we're gonna build up this new uh, capability, public health infrastructure capability, and we're doing that through teams that are distributed across the state. Uh, we've pulled in folks, including uh, public health, uh, you know, public health students and nursing students, but we've trained up uh, over 275 people that are currently trained. Uh, as of today, we're actually using 77 of those. And, and our goal here isn't really about bodies or FTEs. It's about making sure we have enough capacity for follow-up. Right now, if someone, if you test positive with in about four hours average time, you'll be contacted uh, by someone who's a professionally trained contact tracer that will be interviewing you over the phone to find out uh, who are the others that you may have had contact with so we can reach out to them uh, and get their contact information and invite them to a, a, near, a, a next up testing event, uh, et cetera, to make sure. And then where necessary, uh, having people quarantine who don't have systems uh, or people that do are symptomatic for them to isolate uh, during that period so that we can stop the spread through a combination of, of robust contact tracing and our next uh, item, which is targeted effective quarantine. Uh, I would, uh, we'll talk a little bit later and think about CARE 19, but that's another, another, the mobile applications is another part and technology to help us have robust contact tracing and infrastructure. But on the targeted effective quarantine, when we do find those close contacts of a positive, uh, and we get to them quickly, uh, or again, with more testing, we can get to people that are, you know, either we've uh, uncovered positives who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Uh, and, and again, by quarantining those, then this is the way that we can uh, have the state move towards uh, back towards our full economy uh, working, uh, but making sure we're containing the spread. Because as we've said before, just because the calendar turns to May 1, it doesn't mean the virus has gone away. We're just finding a new way to manage it. And we're slowing the spread with, with the first three of these things, widespread testing, two, uh, robust contact tracing, and then three, targeted and effective quarantine. And effective means that uh, we have to have people who are disciplined uh, to, uh, not have contact with others during their quarantine or isolation period. It means we've got to continue to build out opportunities for uh, nonprofits and support organizations to might to do things like deliver groceries to people who maybe uh, during this isolation period that don't have family members or friends that could help uh, make sure that they've got everything they need in terms of food and medicine uh, during their quarantine and they're still uh, during that time frame staying in regular touch with their medical providers uh, but we are uh, been fortunate uh, when we have had uh, one uh, outbreak at a commercial plant, we've been able to get that uh, large scale quarantine, targeted quarantine accomplished uh, to reduce the spread more broadly within the community. And again, these are skills that we're demonstrating that we ha have demonstrated that we can do this that help us get us on the path towards opening up. Number four on the list is protections for our most vulnerable. And this is a, something I know that's important to each and every one of us. Uh, we are, uh, Chris Jones, who's been at this podium before, is leading this effort. Uh, and he is uh, 
uh, you know, making strong progress, particularly as it relates to isolation. Because we've got so many available hospital beds available, we're working on a strategy uh, with the providers where if we have positive that may uh, appear in a uh, congregate care facility, whether that's long-term care, uh, skilled nursing, whether it's uh, if it's a memory care, developmentally disabled, uh, however it might be that we can move positives to places where they're not in contact with, with those that have tested negatives. And again, trying to create appropriate isolation and separation that protects both the residents and the staff. We have enough space to do this, and now we're making sure that we're executing against that. Number five uh, on the uh, list, or I guess number four on protection for uh, most vulnerable uh, is want to bring out another uh, point here, which again, which is just how big this group is, because we do talk a lot about people in congregate living, but there are plenty of people who are vulnerable uh, in that are that either have age related, the 15% of North Dakotans who are over age 65, and then we've got a large number of population. These numbers won't add up to 100 because there's overlap. You may have someone who's got cardiovascular disease, who's also a smoker, who also has diabetes, who's also over age 65, uh, but you can have these, as they say, comorbidities or multiple underlying health conditions that put people even more at risk, and as, uh, we begin to open up as the nation begins to open up its uh, economy again. You're going to see uh, all, I'm sure, all states, all governors in the nation continue to issue warnings and guidelines that are different for people that are elderly or have underlying health conditions because the risk is so much higher with this disease for them than it is for people that are either younger or have none of these uh, underlying health conditions. And we've estimated before uh, that we believe the combination of these, uh, we know at age that's 15%, and then you throw in uh, all these other combinations and you get at least 20% of the population of North Dakota would be considered vulnerable. And that's the group we're trying to protect here under item four. Uh, number five, sufficient health care capacity. I, I don't want to say that we've, uh, you know, crushed this one, but uh, we have thousands of beds available surging up to you know 4,000 6,000 beds uh, and so far because of the great work on the the physical distancing and hygiene practices of of, of North Dakota and showing individual responsibility we've consumed almost none of that and that is uh, so of that we've again even with 23 beds being used today which is a near high uh, that still is like one percent of our capacity uh, only 77 patients uh, so far far in North Dakota have been hospitalized uh, because of COVID, and that's just about 9% of the people who test positive end up being hospitalized. And we've had, and they haven't all come on the same day. And even if they did, we got plenty of room for them. So this one is, uh, we say, check the box on this one. Uh, the next one on adequate PPP actually relates to uh, a couple of things. It relates to the fact that we've really built out supply chains in our country, and they have. Uh, we've been able to replenish stocks. It also relates to the fact that we were in really good position with our state medical cash before we started, uh, and it also relates to the fact that uh, well, we did not uh, at all restrict elective resurg surgeries. Elective surgeries were always available to be conducted uh, in North Dakota, and again, we've. We would encourage people, again, there's risk if you've got a cancer treatment, a heart valve replacement, uh you know, some kind of other surgery that may be, quote, elective, but is really important for you and your health, uh, we would urge you to contact your provider uh, and get those scheduled. Uh, they have the capacity, they've got the PPE, they've got the hospital rooms, they've got the doctors and nurses. And so again, we would encourage people to do not defer uh, needed health care uh, during this time frame and uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, you may get a lot of attention because hospital bed counts are very low right now. So good time to uh, good time to actually get in and get those procedures done. Uh, but with that, our through a combination of demand drop uh, and increase in supply chain, uh, we've got a ample amounts of PPE. Under one estimate, uh, we've got a couple of months worth of. PPE available, uh, even if we had a surge. Uh, and so that is uh, fantastic, so great job, and we'll consider that box checked as well. Uh, new standard operating procedures for reopening. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we uh, we know that businesses that have remained open have applied, uh, and we are, uh, 
our commerce team is working hard on these and we're going to have uh, most of tomorrow uh, dedicated to describing what those new standard operating procedures for reopening will look like. So that one is in process with more to come. And then the last one uh, plans for dealing with a resurgence or a different waves of COVID-19. And this is something that we have to be prepared for uh, in May, in June, we have to be prepared for it throughout the summer and we definitely have to be prepared for it next winter because uh, there right now is uh, no scientific evidence that, that coronavirus will go away. Uh, even if it slows down during the summer, it's still going to be on the planet. It'll be rolling through the winter flu season in the southern hemisphere. It'll make its way back here next year. And so we have to be prepared uh, from now until such time that there may be a vaccine, uh, which could be 18 months or more. We've got to be prepared for dealing with resurgences. And again, the things we've demonstrated here today, the broader testing capability, the contact tracing, the targeted quarantine. If we have an outbreak, whether it comes from a church, a bar, a school, uh, a plant, uh, we'll have the ability to come in and do that in a targeted way and again, reduce the impact uh, and keep it from, from spreading widely across our communities or our state. And so that's number uh, eight. Uh, on the, the, when we bring them all up together, then in terms of sort of checking the boxes, I would say that we feel really good about six out of eight of these. There's two of them, uh, protections for the most vulnerable. We've got some more meetings tonight, uh, with Chris Jones and his team that are doing that. Uh, we've got a, and then we've got, uh, the commerce team and report that we'll be delivering tomorrow. And again, our, our goal for this was to try to, you know, have these all checked by the time we got to the, to the end of end of April. Uh, the other thing which we've talked about too is the uh, presidential guidelines uh, in terms of reopening and the uh, and so we want to talk a little bit about those for a second uh, and, and you can see that here that on these there are some of these are and and some are or uh, in the case of the the first and third ones where the ands are uh, on symptoms, we are uh, checking these off. Uh, we haven't shared the charts here, but the ILL, the, uh, uh, the, which is the flu-like illness uh, symptoms, uh, we're, our charts are all in the right way on the first two on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, in terms of hospital and PPE, we've just covered that, we're in great shape. And then in terms of cases, here is an OR, and on the lower half one, uh, this is where we're seeing that we are in line because our, at our 6.2% is flat uh, and is, is flattened out uh, as we uh, continue to do more and more testing, we're gonna s we expect to see that number uh, hold its way down. Uh, but again, the guidelines that came from the Fed are guidelines. They're not rules per se. Each state has to make their own uh, decisions regarding this. And one of the things we know that as our line is uh, flat on the cumulative 14 day average on that on the, of the White House guidelines, uh, other states may have, this is the math problem. If you've had a huge peak and you were testing at 45% or 35% or 25%, which multiple other states have been, and then you drop for two weeks, you could be meeting the White House criteria, but your number might be three times as high as us. Uh, I think uh, Georgia, for example, is testing at over 20% or 19% positive and we're at 6.2, but from a math standpoint, they're declining and we're flat. So again, this is why it's good there's not a one size fits all because we can make our own decisions as a state about uh, how we wanna do that. So we are well positioned uh, for a, uh, a smart restart. Uh, our positive test rate's been really low. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, fifth best testing capacity continues to improve. Uh, sixth best in per capita, which is a big move up from number ninth. Uh, increasing contact tracing uh, and the personnel and the technology that we're doing for that, both on the, the front end with CARE 19, the back end with uh, the with, with, uh, databases that can help us track more efficiently. Uh, hospital u bed utilization has been low, surge plans are in place, and our uh, fatality rate has been the sixth lowest in the nation. So there are uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, things that give us a lot of encouragement. The next thing I want to say is where is a shout out to uh, North Dakotans in terms of the uh, action that they've taken. Uh, again, we've had a light touch in North Dakota relative to our, our uh, 
in terms of what government mandates have been, as we talked about earlier today, where the majority of our economy re remained open. Uh, but we had you know, tremendous compliance. This is the personal responsibility thing. Huge survey, over 11,000 people, 53% of respondents, half the economy leaving only to buy food and other essential errands. Uh, this is a remarkable number given uh, the number of people that were still working, 33%. Uh, they're distancing as much as possible. These are likely people that were, that were continuing to working and then others take you all the way up to the 98 percent so only 1.2 percent responded on the survey that they weren't uh, doing it so that is uh, fantastic I just want to say go North Dakota uh, and this slide well it wasn't uh, you know part of our eight criteria it's part of the the decision making that it leads us up to the uh, decisions that were made because uh, we would no state could reopen if you didn't have uh, people with uh, highly, high, highly responsible individuals. But I think in North Dakota, we've proven that if you've got limited government and, and high individual responsibility, that's a great combination because the goal uh, was to reduce the spread, which we did, and that was uh, fantastic. So uh, as we talk about North Dakota Smart Restart and where we go from here, uh, we know that we've got an a, uh, executive order 202006 that was, uh, that was um, out uh, that was the one that contained almost in entirety uh, all of the business closures, where you know whether it was bars, restaurants, uh, gyms, theaters, etc. Uh, it also included in there details about uh, visitation for nursing homes. It included details about uh, the uh, you know teleworking. Uh, our current plan, uh, if the current trends progress today, uh, that we're seeing today, and if these hold over the next couple of days, our intention would be to let the current executive orders expire um, on Thursday. We would replace those on Friday with an executive order that allows businesses to reopen using phase one guidelines. And those phase one guidelines would include uh, everything related to physical distancing, uh, limiting contact, hygiene, masks, et cetera, that will vary by business or industry. And we'll talk more about what those guidelines will be tomorrow at tomorrow's uh, event. Uh, we would. Uh, envision during this that we would encourage all businesses that are telecommuting to continue to telework and we would encourage uh, and, and intend that the schools would for this moment continue to do distance learning uh, as we slowly bring back uh, on some things online again reminding everyone that as we turn to may 1 the virus will still be here but what this means is that if you're in the personal care business a bar a restaurant owner others uh, you, it's all voluntary you're not required to open this weekend, but if you uh, choose to open on uh, heading into this weekend, that's something that you can do. Uh, again, if you're able to meet the uh, guidelines, which we will be announcing tomorrow uh, regarding uh, hygiene and distance and taking care of your cust protecting your customers and your, your team members. Uh, so that's the plan for right now. And of course, uh, all of this uh, is uh, contingent on us continuing to see you know great progress like we saw over the weekend, fantastic progress progress that puts us in the right uh, direction. We know that uh, the North Dakota Smart, uh, Resmart, Restart is a roadmap to better, safer, healthier tomorrow for our employers, employees, and customers. Uh, and it'll apply not only to those businesses that were affected by the executive orders, but it's to apply to all businesses uh, that we will go in the new normal. Uh, and again, businesses that have, that have been open uh, Grocers and others have do, been doing, taking a lot of smart actions to make sure they're protecting their team members and their customers. Uh, the fight for COVID-19 is far from over, and we know that there's still much that we have to learn. Uh, we know that we may be humbled uh, by an outbreak that may come uh, in the near future, and we may very well still be only on the very first leg of a long, difficult journey. Uh, and again, uh, the virus is contagious as ever, just as threatening as ever to those that are vulnerable. Uh, but we will we will certainly be, along with other states, uh, for the safety of those that are vulnerable, urging them to stay home and avoid large crowds uh, for at least two weeks more, even after uh, the new standard operating procedures are are in place and businesses begin to reopen on their own uh, voluntary timeline. Uh, 
after Friday. Uh, together, we can move forward with a continued emphasis on saving both lives and livelihoods. Uh, next update uh, is on uh, Commerce Department briefing. This is a heads up. Uh, Department of Congress, Greater North Dakota Chamber, hosting a special business briefing this coming Thursday, April 30th. Uh, and someone will have to shoot me the time uh, for when that is, because I don't see that here, uh, or give me hand signals. Uh, you can register now. It probably includes there on the registration. Uh, that was at 11. Okay, all right. The uh, 11 o'clock, Thursday, April 30th, is when this is going to be. Uh, ndchamber.com. You don't have to be a member of the chamber, uh, but I would uh, encourage all business owners of all sizes, whether you're a self-employed, uh, single you know, individual that's just working on your own, uh, or whether you're a small business or a large business, uh, there's going to be a series of scripted presenters as part of that that will give you updates on the, the CARES Act, that what's called the 3.5, which is another $484 billion in additional funds, both through both the EIDL and the PPP program, $310 billion for PPP. And again, get your applications in. Those open today, Monday, $60 billion for small, mid-size uh, community lenders, $60 billion for the EIDL loans and grants, $75 billion for hospitals, and $25 billion for testing. Uh, some of that coming to the states that allow us to build out our capability. Last Friday, you heard from Eric Hardmeyer and, and uh, the team, uh, all the great work that had been done by Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford, the Commerce Department, and B&D and others. We announced uh, the new two loan programs, uh, one the COVID PACE program and the other is the SELF for the Self-Employed Loan Fund. Uh, th you'll also hear about those programs in more detail on the ndchamber.com. And if you want to learn more about the bank programs, you can go to the BND website. Those loans will become available midweek uh, this week if you're interested in applying for those. Uh, we know that this is a challenging time for businesses, and so under the uh, kind of good news resource topic here, uh, North Dakota does have small business development centers. Uh, they remain available. They've launched a program called the 4R, and I don't know, R, like that's a, like a group of pirates, uh, or uh, I'm not sure, but it's the Recover, Reopen, Reinvent, and Be Resilient uh, is the 4R project, not 4H, 4R. Um, the North Dakota Small Business can access a wide range of comprehensive disaster assistance and relief services available from professional certified business advisors. Guess what? At no cost. Uh, and services include planning and applying for financial assistance uh, and debt relief, including applying for the Paycheck Protection Plan. Some of this stuff's complicated. If you need help, uh, you can reach out. SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loans, that's the EIDL program we just spoke of, addressing impacts on supply chains, operations, finances, payroll, uh, distribution channels, and sales, and much more. Uh, Web integration, e-commerce, online sales, digital marketing, implementing disaster plans, continuity of plans, increasing awareness, mitigating risk of cyber threats. Uh, North Dakota Small Business Development Centers can help you on all of these and more. Uh, they received additional funding from the SBA to increase their service capacity to assist North Dakota small businesses during these times. For information and to access resources, uh, you can go to the NDSBDC dot org uh, and uh, you can find out more and I'm sure or you can call 701-777-3700 uh, or I'm sure if you went to ndresponse.gov uh, under uh, employers there'll be a link there to the NDSBDC or the North Dakota Small Business Development Centers to help have you help navigate all these great new programs. Next topic is unemployment. Friday plus the weekend, uh, so this is three days worth of claims, 2,336. Uh, Friday plus the weekend on the pandemic unemployment assistance, 519. And Friday plus the weekend for the pandemic emergency unemployment comp, uh, 644. All of those represent a little bit of a slowdown, happily on the pace that we were on before. Uh, but again, that brings us to 63,929, almost 64,000 regular claims since March uh, 16th. CARE 19 update. Uh, want to again remind people you have an opportunity to care for yourself, care for your loved ones, uh, and help us uh, 
get the economy going and restarted uh, by helping to be part of a great effort for contact tracing, uh, make it more efficient in North Dakota and help you out if you or someone that you love ever becomes a positive for COVID-19. We now have over 25,500 users. It's available on iPhone and Android, and we hope to see even more of you using this valuable tool. Uh, we uh, don't quite have the heavy hand they have in Australia. The Prime Minister of Australia said they weren't going to reopen until everybody downloaded their app and two million people downloaded it. So I guess the Australians want to get back to the get some shrimp on the Barbie or something. So they, uh, they are, they, they're all after it. We're just encouraging people to download the CARE 19 app. Uh, it does protect your privacy uh, and will help, help us uh, solve uh, and understand how to slow the spread of this virus. Uh, behavioral health update, again, really key. Uh, we know that as we deal with the physical health issues of the virus, the behavioral health is there. That's why I've included something every day. Uh, this comes to you from our update from our behavioral health team. Thank you for providing these updates. Uh, and again, on Executive Order 2020-05.1, we expanded access and coverage for telehealth services uh, for, for behavioral health during the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, and we know that if you need behavioral health services, access to provider can be life-changing and sometimes life savings. And pressures of COVID-19, physical distancing create obstacles. The opportunity to use telehealth may be now more important than ever. Uh, research has shown that a virtual mental health counseling is at least as effective, and in some cases more effective at treating uh, depression and other dangerous diseases uh, as traditional face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, and in earlier this month, our behavioral health division surveyed behavioral health providers. Uh, at the beginning, 37% were offering uh, telehealth. Now it's up to 45%. Others are looking at beginning. We want to see that number climb. So thank you to the telehealth providers for providing those services. And of course, all that's needed, telehealth is a big word, but if you've got a computer, a webcam, uh, FaceTime, uh, you know, built in into your, if the webcam's in, built into your device, uh, as in most phones are today, or p tablets or laptops. You've got internet, in, in, internet in access. In many cases, changes to policies allow for reimbursement for these telehealth services, whether it's private insurance, Medicaid, or utilizing your substance use uh, disorder voucher. Uh, again, we encourage you to reach out to your local private provider or a local human service center to discuss behavioral health services available by telehealth. Additional information can be found at behavioralhealth.nd.gov. Next announcement, uh, Game and Fish Advisory Board meetings. Springtime also comes the traditional regular Game and Fish Advisory Board meetings. Uh, this is where our Game and Fish gets out, uh, talks to people in the uh, regions, uh, and they take input from our those that uh, enjoy the pursuit of fish and game in North Dakota. Uh, this year, we're making sure that the, as we want to get input, but we also want to slow the spread, practicing appropriate physical distancing. So these traditional in-person meetings by Game and Fish are going to host these meeting, public meetings via live stream. Uh, we know that when other cities and groups have gone to live stream, sometimes they've actually seen more people attend. So if you've never attended a local advisory board meeting, if you've got things to say about hunting or fishing in North Dakota, uh, be part of the conversation and the link to the live stream can be found at gf for game and fish .nd .gov, gf .nd .gov. the combined meetings for districts one two seven and eight covering much of western north dakota uh, will take place tonight beginning at 7 p.m central time and uh, and again recognizing that part of that is in mountain time uh, but 7 p.m central daylight time for districts one two seven and eight again a live stream found at gf.nd.gov tomorrow evening for eastern north dakota districts three four five and six uh, at 7 p.m central time again uh, if you're someone who is holds a license uh, and fishes and hunts in north dakota you might enjoy uh, joining the live stream to give some advice to the advisory boards. Good news section again, uh, among those uh, who are most at risk uh, during the COVID-19 are those brave individuals who may be immunocompromised due to an ongoing battle with cancer. Uh, 
Brave the Shave is one of the region's largest fundraisers, providing assistance to families battling childhood cancer and supporting critical cancer research. During Brave the Shave, courageous volunteers show their support to children and families by shaving their heads to raise donations. This year, Brave the Shave has teamed up with KFYR TV host uh, to host the first ever Brave the Shave Telethon, Brave the Shaveathon, not a telethon, but Brave the Shaveathon tomorrow from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. throughout the day. KFWR, their local NBC station, Brave the Shave, Brave the Shave Facebook page throughout the day to see videos of these brave volunteers doing their best to safely shave it all off and learn more about this year's honorees. Many Brave the Shave events have been postponed this year to support physical distancing and help slow the spread, but we can still we can still show our support to these brave uh, folks that are battling childhood cancer. And again, you can visit bravetheshave.net or Brave the Shave Facebook to learn more, to donate, or to participate to the ongoing silent auction. Let's help Brave the Shave reach their $300,000 fundraising goal and show our support for the incredible children in North Dakota families battling childhood cancer. And again, as we uh, as those of you, we've talked a lot about long-term care, but if you need a reason to think about uh, practicing North Dakota SMART guidelines, uh, think about those uh, individuals that are compromised because of their battles with cancer, because the coronavirus can be really a challenge for them. So thank you for that. Uh, and with that, I want to close up, as always, with a little gratitude. I want to thank uh, <clears throat> all of the, the hardworking folks uh, that have, uh, again, throughout this whole weekend, uh, State of North Dakota, National Guard, Department of Health, people that were collecting and doing all the great work, the lab on the testing. I want to thank all the folks from Commerce and B&D who've been working seven days a week on all the things to make sure we can have a North Dakota smart restart. Uh, I want to thank uh, our whole, the, everybody over at the Unified Command and all the folks that are providing the great intel to the lieutenant governor and myself to help us drive and of course the governor's office team uh, are the small but mighty band the governor's office team that has not had a day off in 40 plus days uh, thank them for their great work and and of course uh, uh, thank all of you that are listening because you're an important part of getting the word out to North Dakotans as we continue to go on this journey together uh, thank you and uh, now we'll stand for questions Gonna go with Dave first. Governor, just as a clarification, what's going to be released by Commerce? Is the, are they rules or guidelines or both? It'll be a combination of rules and guidelines because we have, it'll be uh, guidelines for the 93% of the jobs in North Dakota that weren't closed. A lot of those guidelines are already being uh, uh, followed and applied by businesses that are open. Uh, there are going to be actual uh, rules uh, for those areas because the areas that we did close, theaters, gyms, bars, restaurants, uh, you know, to in dining, not to curbside or out, but in the personal care and, and, re and also, you know, visitation to hospital, I mean, or to nursing homes. The things that were covered under the, the orders and the executive orders were the places that we had identified. That was the narrowest slice. That was the scalpel. That was the, how do we close the fewest number of enterprises that have the most number of transmissible contact moments? And that's the place where those were occurring. So as we, uh, you know, to let the current executive orders lapse and apply new ones, there will be rules that people must comply with if you're going to uh, be able to be open. <clears throat> in phase one, and then again, those could keep modifying as we progress. Okay, I'm gonna go Lane and then and then back over to Jacob and then to online. Uh, Governor, since we had a ton of tests um, come back today, how many of those are from Fargo and are we still waiting on any of those from Saturday? Uh, I'll have to have somebody on the testing team uh, give me the answers to how many from Fargo and if we're waiting on any, because I, I don't know of that. I I would anticipate if we got to a new record of, of 1900 that the majority of the over 1100 that were collected at the drive through at the Fargo Dome are included in that, in that number for us to get to that record number, but someone can check for me. Jacob. Governor, uh, your slideshow said that there were a lot of antibody tests available. Wondering what the process is for someone getting one. The, that test plan has not been rolled out yet. And then there was also, um, I know there was, you know, some news today again on, uh, and in the White House briefing again, we had a call today at one o'clock uh, Central Time, 
uh, where we participated with the president, the vice president, Dr. Burks, and uh, all the other leaders of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. In that briefing from Dr. Burks, uh, she indicated because there has uh, been uh, concern about the accuracy of some of the antibody tests. Uh, there have been hundreds of different antibody tests that have been rolled out. Uh, some of those have had lighter than the normal FDA approval. Uh, they were, uh, so it was new information to us in the state that if you're gonna do an antibody test, that a person should have two tests not one, they should be tested once and a second time. And again, an antibody test is to try to determine uh, with some conclusivity if you've had the virus before. Uh, and, and that is useful uh, to a degree uh, because there is a belief that if you've had it before, you're less likely or unlikely to get it again. It's not 100% that you couldn't uh, have a, a relapse or a reoccurrence, uh, but if it's less likely, that could help us get a better understanding of what people would call herd immunity, which is how many people have had it. Uh, so again, I, I see that. Uh, when we shared the numbers earlier in the presentation today about getting to 4,000 tests in, in, um, in, May and 6,000 in June. Uh, those were the current kind of testing, the PCR testing we're doing, the ones that are the, the, the you know, saliva-based go to the lab test as opposed to the, to the antibody testing. So those numbers excluded because when we get into antibody testing, that could be, we could be testing tens of thousands of people on antibody testing, but we're still a ways away from that. Follow up quickly then, Governor. Uh, of the antibody tests that the state has ordered, do you know how many of them are considered those concerns over accuracy? I don't know that because I just saw the report right before I came up here, and so I need to you know, check with our team on uh, which manufacturer. I know we, we ordered from a uh, reliable vendor that we had a previous relationship with, and so I think we're in good shape, but we'll uh, make sure we're checking on that. Jeremy? You mentioned um, that businesses will be allowed to reopen if conditions hold, if the trends hold. I'm wondering specifically what trends are those that you're looking at? Well, I, I think we want to make sure that we're, I mean, the big one is uh, percent positives. If we can continue to keep testing up and percent positives low, you know, then we're trending on that one uh, slide uh, that we're looking at, and we, we've been looking at the whole time, and then it's also included in the White House guidelines in the bottom of the middle of the White House guideline, which is what you're rolling 14-day average for the on percent positives. I mean, so what it basically say as long as we're not having a big uptick uh, above, uh, you know, our current trend line, we would feel that we've got the capacity for testing, contact tracing, and targeted quarantine to to take on risk. I mean, we're dialing, you dial up a little risk of more spread when you open back up area, you know, businesses that could lead to transmissible moments, but we're willing to take on some more risk, not because the virus has gone away, but we've got more capability as a state to be able to respond to those risks so we can take on more risk and then manage it. Because risk isn't about eliminating risk, it's about can you manage it? And I feel we're in much better pace to manage it than we were a month ago. A follow-up to that. Um, today it was announced that there were 40 new cases tied to nursing homes and long-term care facilities in the state. Um, obviously that's a raw number jump and not a percent positive, but as far as the rules are concerned for visitation at nursing homes, are you considering lifting those to any extent? Not at all. I mean, I, I, that's one of the boxes I left unchecked. Uh, I mean, where we still have got to make progress. Uh, I'm feeling good that by tomorrow we're going to have our reopening plans that we can share here in shape. But if I've got one concern on our eight-point checklist, it's you know protecting the most most vulnerable and in this uh, increase uh, of cases in home in, in homes because it's those cases are in some cases it's staff, in some cases it's residents, and uh, we've. You know, you keep you keep the visitors out, but if the staff are going in and out every day and then they're leaving, uh, they've got families. I mean, it, it does represent another risk area for us. And when I talked on that, I, mean, I skipped it over on that slide, but we've also got what we call rapid response teams. Not only do we want to do more uh, in terms of testing, but we also want to be able to come back in uh, with teams and whether those are National Guard led or others led or other led or whether they're private companies uh, that, you know, vendors we work with, but we want to be able to do 
uh, when we have an outbreak, we want to do the deep cleaning of those facilities as well, uh, which is a challenge because, you know, if you, have an, if you have an outbreak in a manufacturing plant, you can close for 14 days and do the deep cleaning. If you've got a, you know, a uh, people start getting positive in a long-term care facility and you're not moving them out and you're not having a chance to really clean the thing, then that's where you can have this sort of, uh, you know, the spread that would continue. And that's something we've got to keep really working on. Uh, <clears throat> online. Matt Henson with WDAY. With three cases tied back to the Simplop plant in Grand, in Grand Forks, um, which employs nearly 400 people, are there any plans to order a mandatory quarantine like an LM to those employees during the plant shutdown? Uh, not that I've heard yet, but it's possible that that uh, could be happening, but I've, I've, not, I've not heard that for question for Matt. And I'm sure that would be a decision that would be arrived between state health, local health, and and management, but I haven't been briefed on that one. Take another one online, and then we'll back, and then we'll do Travis next. Chris Larson with AM 1100, the flag in Fargo. Will individuals that work in barber shops or hair salons be able to work on clients at nursing homes? Uh, that is a that's that intersection that we talked about before, and I guess we'll give details on that tomorrow, uh, because that's that intersection of uh, somebody from the outside, uh, you know, being in close contact with someone inside of a nursing home, and we want to make sure that that's one of the areas of vulnerability that we've really got the protection dialed up in a smart way. So more on that more on that tomorrow, but again, I would also caveat that I understand that that is. Uh, one of the things that we know from residents of nursing homes would love to get back uh, to <clears throat> being able to, as they said when I was a kid in Arthur at the Good Saman, get your hair done. Uh, we know that a lot of residents would like to get their hair done, and we know that they're, if that's somebody who is inside the facility and already works there and providing personal care. I mean, if they're helping, you know, feed, clothe, and manage somebody already and they're also doing their hair, you know, that, you know, makes a lot of sense. If it's a, you know, contract outside person that's coming into a facility from outside, you know, that's something we're going to have to take a look at because we're trying to, uh, as was just in the previous question, we've, we've, we know that we've got the potential for outbreaks in homes and we want to make sure we're protecting those people. <clears throat> Is it Travis? Okay. You have nice and loud, Travis. So they, you're on all the way. He's all the way in the back row here. So, but thanks for being here. The data that you have on hand now does that help as as the restaurant owners start looking at the possibility of opening up? But you've also mentioned the possibility of another upsurge. Uh, does the data you have now does that help them kind of ease into another closure? If that would come around, would there be a little more lead time now, knowing what we know now, so to speak? Well, I, I guess I, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but I think if we can get, you know, get open again, those the small percentage of the state. I mean, because again, you know, as you know, construction, energy, agriculture, education, healthcare all remained open. But it's, you know, it's a for some people, closing bars and restaurants, and barber shops and gyms was that was that was the thing that really tore up people's lifestyle because that was something that was part of their daily routine or part of their, uh, you know, part of their social life. Uh, and, and not, and, and again, understanding in America, before COVID, 50% of the food consumption in America was in restaurants, not at home. I mean, this, the whole supply chain to try to figure out a way to feed people at home was a, a challenging thing. But I would hope that once we get open, that we don't have to do a statewide closure again, because now we got the capability. I mean, you know, would we have to close a restaurant because they had an outbreak? Possibly. You know, would we have to close a plant? Uh, you, you know, most certainly that could happen if you have an outbreak at a plant. We'll close, you know, we'll be working with employers and closing plants and quarantining just like we are now because those outbreaks could still happen. But if we get, if we get, you know, bars and restaurants and everybody open again, hopefully it won't be statewide. So they would be, it'd be much more targeted down to maybe the individual businesses, you know, versus a statewide uh, thing. I mean, that's assuming that our capability can keep up with this, uh, with the virus. But I, I, Feel we've got the right foundation in, in place. But like I said, we're on a journey, uh, and it's it, people may talk with certainty uh, about the future. But I think that one of the uh, things that we have to have as North Dakotans, I mean, is you know, if you grew up like I did in a in a farming community, I mean, one of the things that you realized is that if you thought you could predict the weather, 
on what was going to come next, and you know you you could get humbled in a hurry, or if you thought you could predict the price of what the crops might be, and so we just have to maintain that humility to understand that we don't know everything that's ahead, uh, but we're going to make the best decision at the time we make it with the best information. Go online and then back to Jacob and then to Jeremy. Renee Jean, Williston Herald. What was the holdup on unemployment from the CARES Act PUA payments, and what is the timeline timeline on delivering that aid? I was there. I'm a update that was coming in right at 3:30, day before I came down here, on that one. Okay, payments will be coming out on a debit card. So that's the, that's the new news. The holdup, I think, for Gene, we covered this before. We've got the aging mainframe. Uh, there was no such thing as this program that ever existed in all the code written for unemployment insurance software for the history of mankind. Uh, federal government came up with a new program, passed it in a week, launched it. You know, the rules came out about the time they launched it. You know, trying to get all of that into a system where you can automatically make payments to tens of thousands of people takes a while. Uh, we had to find uh, vendors to assist us in, in making those code changes without crashing the regular system. That was a miracle of technology that others and hard work and innovation that we don't need to go in all the details, but kudos to the whole team that made that happen. And then again, as we've worked through, we've you know cleared most of that backlog. But again, as you hear now, uh, one piece of that's going to come out as a debit card versus an actual check. Hopefully, that'll be a, a good 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 piece of news for people. I think number of checks written has gone down in the U.S. Um, just as a side, I mean, I'm having a flashback. My brain does this sometimes, but as a trivia, I've served on a Federal Reserve Advisory Board back in the early 1990s, and there was literally an airlines in the United States that that flew every night, canceled checks between different Federal Reserve organizations. And for those of you that are, some of you that are so young in this room that may not even have a checkbook, uh, would think that that's an incredible thing, that there'd be planes full of paper flying around. Uh, but that's the way the system used to work. So as we, quote, get the checks out, I'm happy to hear that we're getting out debit cards instead of actual physical checks. Less flights for the Federal Reserve to fly at night. Okay, Jacob. I'm old school, I have a checkbook as well. Um, is there a, a, a certain cutoff date for uh, possibly expanding the business closures for the expected or an anticipated uptick. Like if there's an uptick on Thursday, should businesses expect the closures to be expected? I, I'm hoping we're not going to be that surprised because uh, the tests that we're, that we're doing, you know, have sort of a, a two day kind of, a, we're, we've really tightened up the lag time. There used to be take a test and it might've been three, four, five, those ones to Quest Lab took seven days. We're getting everything turned around in two days. And so we'll have a very good feel, I think uh, by Wednesday, if we're in, in good shape and we're trending or not. Cause these, these trend lines don't just jump all over the map. Uh, you know, they, they, they tend, as you see, they've got some some ability and, and a, a departure from the trend line uh, would be quite obvious to us. I think right now we're on on a trend we're on the trend line we want to be. So I'm feeling feeling confident. Uh, but again, if people are planning on their reopenings, I mean, they should anticipate uh, when we talk tomorrow that uh, that if if you're as many other states uh, have already issued guidance, in some cases it's 50% of uh, occupancy. I mean, I, I wouldn't load up your freezers with uh, food, uh, you know, have a blowout, you know, opening weekend, I would think more that it's going to be a combination of there's going to be some restrictions on volume. And again, it's voluntary. People don't have to open. And then you're going to have to have enough. It depends really on your relationship with your customers. I mean, if you're in a small town and you know everybody in town and they know you and they know you've got the right uh, procedures in place and they know people are wearing masks and they know the spacings are there, you may not need to do any advertising. If you're, I mean, to have people feel comfortable and confident that they can go in to an establishment and that they're not taking a health risk. Uh, for others, um, it you know, may, may take a while. And again, you're, if you're serving people that have largely been over age 65 with underlying health conditions, uh, we'll be encouraging them strongly to stay home. And so again, people should think about not only, you know, what, you know what's your customer set, What's the business opportunity? What's the size of that? And, and what and what the uh, restrictions might be that are going to uh, also strain business models for a while. Okay, I'm going to go online and then I'll come back to Jeremy and then to Dave. 
Alan Burke with the Emmons County Record. Is it scientifically sound to be mixing the drive-through surveillance testing results with results of restricted tests where people have to meet a threshold of either symptoms or circumstance to be tested? Well, I'm, I'm uh, sort of sitting on the word scientifically sound. Uh, we certainly try to take a look at those that are inbound uh, versus those that are what we might call outbound, but we're very comfortable on, on aggregating those results and showing those together in part because it's, we're not at the Fargo do Dome doing 1,100 random tests. At the Fargo Dome, we were by invitation said to people, you've been in contact with a, you know, you've been in close contact with someone who's a positive. And if we are targeting a set of people, and as we talked about here, our guidelines, if 60% of what we want to do is, is, is uh, you know, people that are symptomatic or healthcare workers or have a high probability, and then 40% is people that we are doing surveillance, and we're still coming up with these low numbers, I feel like we've got a really uh, a good base. And again, anybody that knows statistical, if you're, you know, scientifically sound, maybe because this really is a, science is more about statistics, but we've got a large enough pool where we can feel confident that that percent pops positive probably is representative uh, if we'd you know if we'd done another 1100 the very next day at the same location with the same criteria we likely would have come up with a similar number I mean we've got enough volume that we're feeling confident that we we know uh, about how much COVID is out there but good question glad people are digging into the methodology okay I'm doing Jeremy and then Dave so I'm not sure of the percent positive in Cass and Grand Forks counties, but the raw number of cases has grown pretty significantly in the last two weeks. Is there any consideration for keeping business closures in place in those counties while for the rest of the state? Well, we've been in close contact with all the mayors uh, around the state, but I'd say the ones that Brent uh, Sanford and I have been the most contact with have been uh, Mayor Brown in Grand Forks and Mayor Mahoney in Fargo, interestingly, uh, both are doctors. Uh, so they, we have, a, we've been in close contact with them. Uh, I think, again, we look at the percentages, uh, not just the absolute numbers, but on a percentage basis, they're not all out of line with other parts of the state. We didn't show those today, but we've shown, I mean, in terms of percent positives uh, versus the test taken. So we want to be smart about it, because we know nationally, uh, metro areas with higher density uh, have shown an inclination to have higher spread than rural areas. I, I think that's uh, you know showing up. Uh, but we also uh, we also know that uh, that borders you know represent a, a problem. I mean you know if we if we said hey they're closed in you know they're closed Cass County's closed and Grand Forks County's enclosed, uh, you what you might that might uh, be. A, a business boom to somebody just outside the county border, but it might also send a lot of people to some place where a small town might go, hey, we just soon not have those folks there and maybe we won't even open up our bar because we don't want to have 100 people from Fargo or Grand Forks here. So, I mean, this, this happens. Uh, we know it's happening in other parts of the state and we'll see this as, because uh, we're, 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 openings will occur not in complete synchronicity and that will cause movement among certain populations to go where they can to places that are open so we have to balance we have to balance the risk of the risk of not opening them you know Cass County and Grand Forks with the risk of opening them and and so uh, again we'll keep working with the mayors on that we do have the ability to open you know by county by city uh, those are things that other parts of the country have looked at talked to other governors that have done that uh, I know down I know in Nebraska you know they've got their biggest outbreak is not in their it's not in Omaha, it's in a smaller, it's in Grand Island is where they've got their highest amount. So then, you know, should they keep Grand Island closed when they open some others up? It happens here that we're, that it, it's again, it's more evenly spread because, well, they've got more absolute numbers on a per capita basis. Their Fargo and Grand Forks are not really way ahead of everybody else. I think we've got some counties in the West that are actually higher. And, um, is there a worry that Minnesota residents will come across the borders to bars and restaurants and personal care businesses? I, I'm, I think that they do already. I mean, I, if you just take a look at the Fargo metro area, um, if we if we know that uh, the healthcare, we know that in healthcare in Fargo and Grand Forks, about 30% of those t 
typically those providers are serving 30% Minnesota. I'm just gonna take a stab that most bars and restaurants in Fargo and Grand Forks had 20 to 30% of their customers from Minnesota pre-COVID. So if, you know, is that number gonna go up some, you know, because of the, because if we open up first, maybe, um, but it's, uh, it's they're, they're all, they're all from the, from the eyes of the virus, they're all one, it's all one metro, area. it's all one community area. So I, I don't think we can really differentiate by the address that's on your, your, your license. I think it's really, uh, those people are already in that community. Okay, online and then to Dave, is that okay? Robin Travers, 660 KEYZ in Williston. Are you aware of the positive cases at the Bobcat plant in Gwinner? I, I believe I am. response so far <laughs> uh, yeah the uh, Bobcat uh, they had a they, I think they had a two-week shutdown they put enhanced health and safety protocols they were notified uh, five days later on the 24th individuals tested um, we see follow-up uh, so then on uh, they chose again to close the specific areas in which the individual had been working. They launched a deep clean on the 25th. Uh, then they reopened the evening shift. Uh, then on the 26th, they got notified by a second employee that they were confirmed positive. Uh, that individual had not been in the facility since Wednesday, April 22nd, uh, and, and was not showing symptoms when the facility has been clarified that the deep clean addressed both employee work areas where these two positives were found. Uh, the individuals have not been in the building for several days. Facility now requiring employees wear masks uh, where social distancing is not possible. Uh, and, and then the, uh, you know, of course, if you're a welder, you can't wear a paper mask. That wouldn't be a, a good thing. You could catch on fire like I did in high school shop. That's another story. Uh, but I, true story, ordered, uh, they've ordered thermometers. Uh, you know, they're going to screen employees prior to shift. They've marked uh, the, the floor, uh, you know, six feet apart. They've changing the way shift startup meetings work and are happening. Uh, so they're broadcasted inside the building or through a sound system as opposed to group meetings. No visitors are now allowed in the facilities. Uh, they've dialed up hand hygiene practices, increased hand sanitizer access, common areas constantly cleaned. They're following CDC guidelines, uh, doing the best to help employees follow the protocol within the facility at home. And then the, uh, the there there's a Bobcat VP, uh, who's in charge of health and safety, uh, in charge of their HR, has been in daily contact with the Department of Health. That's all I know about that one. Dave? Uh, you mentioned that 275 people are trained, correct, for um, the contact tracing. Yes. Is that enough? Or what do you think might be a, a more reasonable number? Well, I think the team that was trying to size this this weekend I, has it's jumped around. I think the number they're talking about in total size could reach 500. But I want to, again, assure people this is not, these may not be 500 FTEs because this could be someone who's doing part-time. We've even actually got people in the health department that are doing hotline work when the hotline's busy and then they go back and do contact tracing. So they're wearing two hats. But the key is to have enough people trained in a flex workforce so that if we do have an outbreak, then, and you've got, say, you had an outbreak and 50 people were identified at one location as positive, that instead of us calling some in two hours and some in four hours and some the next day and some the next day and some the next day, the point of contact tracing is part of it is speed. I mean, you've got to get to the quickly there, and we would like to have a metric where we can call anybody who's positive within four hours or less. We're doing some, I know uh, Mylon Tufty's doing some checking with other states to see if they have metrics of what that would look like. But I, I think it seems like a reasonable number. Uh, you know, two hours would be better uh, than four hours. But if we've got the capacity, so we'll continue to scale that. The other question is, if we can make them more productive with the IT resources that we're applying, the CRM back end, make it more of an automated versus a paper process, we might need less people. They're just going to be less people that can do do more contact analysis per day because they've got the productivity tools that allow them to do that. So it's a, it's a, it's, we're managing for capacity, not headcount. Jeremy? I'm wondering if you know how many cases are now tied to the LM plant in Grand Forks? I personally don't. I know we had, I know we had a number at one point that was LM plus 
household members plus contacts, uh, but I, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay, we'll dig that one up for you. One more. It's going online where we are. Eric Arndt with KZZY in Devil's Lake. Given that many school districts in this region end the school year prior to Memorial Day, what are the odds that students will not be back in the classroom this year? Uh, I'm not an odds maker, Eric, so I won't uh, issue odds today. Uh, but I would say that we'll be taking a, a good hard look at a variety of options uh, and and we'll be working with the uh, ND United, uh, which, you know, the, the teachers union, we're working with the superintendents, we'll be working with the school board association, with DPI, governor's office, all the groups that work so well together when we got on distance learning quickly. And we're going to try to come up with things that are uh, maybe a list of options that may be possible and some things may be possible in certain districts and not others uh, we've and this could be everything from nobody comes back at all and we just do distance learning through the end to we're somehow uh, figure out a way to salvage the last couple weeks of a of a more normalized school year uh, or maybe it is a uh, opt-in i mean we'll see a whole range of options uh, so i'm not and i don't know uh, i, I so, so I'm not trying to shade a decision because I don't even know what all the options. I mean, earlier today, I even said, hey, I'd like to even see more options. We know that uh, some states, as they're thinking about doing this, are allowing uh, some kids back into uh, shop, for example, if they can't complete their projects, but they, they're going in on different shifts so that there's less density, uh, that they're, you know, do you go in where you've got less kids in the building? Do you do it with not all the grades at the same time? Uh, do you do something that's really specifically really about seniors to help them uh, recoup some memory before they graduate and everybody else doesn't come back? Uh, so, you know, or do you do it, you know, K through six because they may be less vulnerable to coronavirus, but then how do we protect children that are got immunocompromised or how do we protect protect teachers that maybe have underlying health issues, whatever. So there's a lot of work safety and other issues to work at. The good news is that there is not the economic pressure as there were on bars, restaurants, personal care business, others, because all the teachers are getting paid, the superintendents are getting paid, uh, you know, the people that aren't, you know, probably getting paid extra are the parents who are home helping with all the homework. Uh, they're the ones that I'm sure would love to have school back in session. Uh, and we're, we are, and so we're, you know, we're working on that, but this was a priority for us as we start to open back up uh, was a, uh, the dial of trying to dial back up the, the ones that had mandatorily affected. And again, if you're out there and you were not affected by any of the closures, say, say you know, dentists or retail or manufacturing, uh, as we've seen, uh, again, you're, you're eligible to open again right now uh, using all the guidelines and that you, that you uh, would think to keep you and your customers and everybody safe. And for those that fall under the, the 2206, uh, we'll have more uh, definitive guidelines uh, tomorrow as part of our briefing tomorrow on the North Dakota Smart Restart. But with that, again, I want to close uh, by just saying we would not be in this position today to do this or consider this uh, if it weren't for the great people of North Dakota who on this uncharted journey that we've been on have uh, found a way to practice uh, uh, the North Dakota Smart guidelines on, on distancing and hygiene in a way that have kept our numbers among the best uh, in the nation in terms of uh, actual spread of the disease and we wouldn't be in this position without the incredible work of the team from the state of North Dakota who's put together new capabilities around uh, testing uh, contact tracing uh, and quarantine and isolation that we just we didn't have at this scale uh, on March 11th. So we've come a long way together. And we're in, as we, when we started, we said we were well prepared and well positioned. And I would say as we enter this new phase, we remain well prepared and well positioned, which is a great spot to be in. So way to go, North Dakota. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow at 3.30.